soon as you register. She said point she's board. wondering how much persistence is affected by the fact that students have to pay in full. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Within yeah. 24 hours. I just want to say one more thing about the last day of attendance. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but the students have figured this out. So if they stop coming to class for face to face, they stop, well, for online too, but if they stop participating, but if they stop coming to class before that 60% mark, then CTC has to pay back the entire Pell Grant, um, if they've done it across all their courses. There's other criteria in there. It's not just one class. but um, And then we have to try to get it from the student, which we're not a collection agency. So that's very hard. Basically, what we do is put a hold on them, and then they just don't come back. They go to another school. Um, so that doesn't work. But I've noticed that I have students, especially this fall, they were gone for four or five weeks. I emailed them, I bugged them, I tried to get them in there because I wanted them in there one day after the 60% mark. And they showed up final exam week. They had gone four to five weeks and they showed up for one day or they showed up for the final. So they have figured this out, that word's out. Um, now they still get an F and they'll still be in trouble like probation wise, but um, I just was wondering if you noticed, so that's why that's happening, because we used to be they would just fall off and we'd never see them again, but they have figured out that there's going to be a hold, and they're going to have to fight that. But then if you got your money, though, that's all they care about, they get benefits. Correct, yeah, and unless they get really on probation and get picked up. Good afternoon. I recognize that you all just had fried chicken, probably a little bit sleepy, so I will not be before you long. I have just a couple of items that I'd like to share with you before uh, Mr. Harmsey comes up. So, good afternoon. Welcome back. I trust that each of you had an enjoyable holiday break. I know that I did. Um, and it's good to see you all back. Um, just a couple of things. Finance and administration. There's, an, there's a, um, an update to the organizational structure there. Effective November 1, the chancellor made a change. And as a result of that change, I assumed responsibility for the College Development and Foundation Office, as well as the Europe Campus and Navy Campus operations. So I thought I had my hands full with HR, <coughs> IT, finance, et cetera. My hands are really full. But fortunately, I also acquired a very capable staff. So I'm very fortunate in that. Um, fiscal 2018-19 annual financial report. Uh, this was a collective success. We received a clean audit. <laughs> Uh, from our external auditor, no findings, and that is a direct result of the things that we do collectively throughout the year in managing our budgets and, and our respective areas. And it also resulted, uh, it also helped to uh, result in the performance award that the Board of Trustees and the Chancellor so generously awarded to us last month. I think that was really great. But the Chancellor will tell you, as will Mr. Liberty, our Comptroller, Associate Deputy Chancellor of Finance, uh, will tell you that it's because of the things that you all do throughout the year is why we were able to do that. So thank you and pat yourselves on the back. 87th Legislature. Uh, as the college works to implement laws that were passed during the last le legislative session, which closed out in May of 2019, we're already gearing up for the 87th legislative session. Um, in fact, this morning, Mr. Yiannopoulos, myself, uh, Mr. Bob Liberty, and Mr. Ru Rudy Sandoval, we met with Representative Brad Buckley to talk about one of the issues that is really important to the college right now. Um, we, we were successful last year in getting this, uh, the, le the legislative code, uh, the local government code, excuse me, amended to include community colleges in the, uh, with regard to the disabled vet tax exemption. And what that means is there were some municipalities that were made whole, they were actually reimbursed for the lost revenue. We who, um, that figure amounts to about $2 million between the ISD, the Colleen ISD and the Copper's Cove ISD, uh, Colleen and Cove. It resulted in about $2 million in lost tax revenue for us. And so because community colleges weren't included in that, we were not made whole. 
So in meeting with Representative Buckley this morning, we, we uh, explained the issue to him. He was already familiar with it. We also discussed how community colleges are financed, different from uh, universities, of course. And it was an extremely productive meeting. We will continue to work with him uh, in, in preparation for the 87th session. And uh, we, we're confident that we don't know what the outcome will be, but we know that we will be well, well represented on the issue. Um, contracts and other documents. It, there, recently, there have been a couple of instances where department heads, and I'm not just talking academic, I'm talking student services and administration, even in my area. There have been a couple of instances where department heads have either signed contracts, agreements, or other uh, communications obligating the college or making decisions for the college. And one of the things that I want to remind you of, uh, and you may not know, so it may not be a reminder for some of you, the Board of Trustees, uh, by policy, has authorized three individuals, Chancellor Jim Yiannopoulos, uh, Mr. Ted Gonzalez, who is the Associate Deputy Chancellor for Business Services, and myself, to negotiate on behalf of and obligate the college. We are the three signatories for the college, except when delegated. And so if you have a, a document, please, a, a contract document of any type, please forward it directly to Mr. Gonzalez for processing. And in terms of communications, letters, et cetera, with outside agencies, I recommend you speak directly with your deputy chancellor to ensure uh, that communication is sent forth uh, properly. It's, uh, these measures are both a matter of legality and liability and not only protects the college, but you as well. <laughs> Next, Mr. Mark Harmson will come and give you a facilities and construction update. I hope you all have a wonderful spring semester. Take care. All right, thank you. Uh, I will uh, be brief on some of the comments, but I wanted to give a couple quick updates on some things that you're going to be seeing around campus. Uh, the first thing was the infrastructure project. Most of you may or may not be aware that uh, this had been going on for quite a while. Through the project, we were able to install a number of uh, actually 16 new chillers, boilers, pumps, external piping that impacted 16 buildings uh, across campus, primarily the lower part of campus. There's been some uh, questions, and uh, Dean Anderson asked about the, uh, for me to mention about interior building temperatures. Uh, one of the things, so it's actually fairly, I, I, you know, it was comfortable when I walked in here, so I hope that uh, the spring is going to be similar in, in most areas. But uh, I, I'm not, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail. It's kind of like. It's a very <laughs> so let me just let me just say it's uh, there are multiple facets to how the system operates. Uh, the new equipment, the chillers, the boilers, are just one component of it. The other piece that we're working on that I think will help us is certainly going to be staff training. There was actually a staff training on some uh, building controls today. Some building controls integration and how it communicates with the mechanical systems throughout the building certainly has an impact. Uh, testing and balancing to make sure you have proper airflow within uh, individual rooms. And then a commissioning piece, which makes sure that equipment within the building is actually functioning properly. Uh, so while we have new chillers and boilers in place, we still have to make sure that all of the other pieces within the system are functioning properly. And when that doesn't happen, you experience uh, cold temperatures or warm temperatures within the space. So if, uh, if something like that does happen, I apologize. You can contact facilities. Uh, I gave you the extension there to uh, the main department, 1196, uh, and we can go ahead and try to see what we can do to uh, continue to work on that. Uh, those, those improvements will continue to be made over the next several months uh, as everything gets uh, wrapped up on that piece. Uh, the other thing that you're gonna see around campus is irrigation. Uh, the grounds team is actively continuing to try to create additional green spaces. Uh, while the mall, I think, is going to look really great, we want to extend that beyond the mall area. Right now, they're working at the uh, System Services Building 111. They're going to see them back around the duck pond. They'll be back over by the football field and some other areas. So we're going to continue to, uh, to look at doing that across campus. Uh, one of the things you may have noticed when you came in today is some parking lot improvements that are taking place over uh, between uh, the dorm and the, uh, the current Student Services Building. 119 uh, that's going to be happening under four phases uh, this week 
they're going to be uh, continuing to work on the front part of lot F1, which is uh, what you see when you drive by on Academic Drive. The, uh, the Academic Drive area, the little loop roads, as well as the front part are going to be resurfaced and that should be completed by January the 17th. So next, I think that's next Friday. Uh, then we're gonna move into phase two, the green section, which is the back part of F1. That will be closed from January the 20th to February the 4th. Uh, we'll be uh, installing new base and asphalt there. Right after that, we're gonna be moving into phase three, which is kind of that gold or yellow area uh, in F2. Uh, that will be closed, that area will be closed February the 5th through March the 4th, right before spring break and it will include a section of Resident Drive. So when that happens, we're probably gonna end up closing all of Resident Drive, so folks will need to come in through Academic Drive. And then we're gonna be resurf or doing some seal coating in two parking lots. Those are the kind of the pink areas, <coughs> Lot I, which is right in front of the administration building, and then Lot E2, which is over by the power plant, and that will be happening over spring break. We need some warmer weathers for that. CO code to uh, adhere properly, so that will occur at that point. Uh, if you come into campus from Clear Creek, you may see some orange fencing and stuff uh, and ask what's going on over there. So uh, there are two locations, Clear Creek, where some of the work is actually started, uh, and then we're going to be over by the tennis courts, the loop road entrance. We're going to be putting up some uh, gateway <coughs> monuments to better create an entry point onto campus. So this is a, a small little rendering of what that will look like. We'll have about a 20 foot tower that will be on the right hand side as you enter. Uh, and then a smaller version of the Central Texas College sign that you see on 514 uh, will actually be on the, uh, the left side. And then over by the tennis courts as you come in off of Loop Road, we'll have a very similar sign there. Uh, and then at, at some point we'll be going back, maybe looking at the, the monument that's over by the dorm, and then looking in off of uh, the entrance off of the, the, the frontage road uh, right by 101 and 118. But we wanted to go ahead and try to make a more predominant, profound or predominant entrance so that people when they come onto campus they know they're coming onto CTC. Uh, the last thing I was going to go ahead and mention, and I don't know if I mentioned this, in the past, uh, we're putting up a small little mall memorial, which will be between 152, the planetarium, and the science building. Uh, it'll be for, in recognition of our fallen students who have served in the military, first responders and that, and this kind of gives you a quick little rendering of what that'll look like. Um, we're going to be uh, starting on the actual fountain itself, probably within the next week or two, so you'll see some activity and stuff that is uh, going on. Anyway, that uh, concluded what I had. Hopefully. 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 I didn't see anywhere where it could designate where they should park. Um, I don't know if we could add something like that, because I don't want to lose students, but if they're having construction, it's not even open, let me go away from where any students are going on campus. Like, where are they supposed to park? Well, the, 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 um, I think you're right. We didn't specifically put up a sign that had an arrow for additional parking, because the whole, there is a section behind F1, which is currently tore up, that is all that's available for parking. There are several rows there, and then all of F2, which is directly behind the yeah. Student Services Building and the System Services Building, that's all open for parking as well. Behind the building itself. Behind the building itself. So yeah. I can I can uh, I can talk to uh, William Duggar, he's our town <coughs> supervisor, and see when we have events and other things, we put out some additional signage. So. Uh, yeah, that's a, a good idea. We can go ahead and do that and try to put them up near the entrance <coughs> where they can go through and, uh, you know, at least, actually there's only one way. You have to go into the entrance closest to student services in order to drive to the back. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that when they start to resurface, which will be in the next couple days, 
the front part of that F1 lot, you're going to see some equipment out on Academic Drive. They're going to be milling up the asphalt because they were going to go ahead and do it at the same time. Academic Drive it will not be closed. When they do that, they're going to have some folks there with flags directing people around. So uh, hopefully that doesn't create too much confusion because that's going on. We, the, the intent was really to try to get it all done before Monday when the students were going to go ahead and look at being here. Um, the entire schedule, though, was dependent upon uh, the you know rain, the weather, and unfortunately, we got uh, some very late notification that while we were off, the asphalt plant and the quarries also closed down for almost two weeks during the same time. So it was kind of uh, a little bit of bad luck, but we had already started the process, so. <laughs> it's going to be painful no matter when we do it, easier just to go ahead and try to get it done as quickly as possible. <laughs> we, we can take questions. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, the, the building sign, I get stopped by visitors on campus, and they may have just driven right by the building. The instructions they say the building number, whatever it is. On a sign, on our sign, it may say student services. Um, okay, we need them. Are you, are you referring to the monument signs, the, the new monument signs we put up? Uh, yes, and we actually did that intentionally for now. Um, give me to talk about. Okay, so uh, one of the things that I, I'm sure you guys are very aware of is the building numbering uh, that we have throughout campus. Very confusing. Uh, it, it was originally set up based upon when the buildings were built. So you can start with 101 and then go to 102, et cetera. Well, it just kind of stayed in that general sequence. So there is uh, work that's currently going on to renumber all of the buildings. I think. Uh, it'll take until I think the plan to roll it out is not this summer, but next summer, because we, we've been working through Kali. And there are some logistical things we have to resolve in college before we can go ahead and actually put it on the signs. So the intent is probably next spring, you're going to start to see where we're going to put the numbers on those monument signs. Uh, along with that, we're also going ahead and redoing the signage on the buildings. So Eagle Hall was one that was recently done. Um, Shoemaker Center was recently done. I think there's a couple other ones. But we were trying to avoid putting a number on the monument, have to take it off, redo it, and then put it back on. But hopefully once we get done, it'll basically, the numbering scheme will work from the west part of campus east. And we, we worked with the city of Colleen to try to mirror how a normal city would do it. So when you're driving down the street, you have maybe even on one side, odd on the other side, and, and so hopefully that will help you find the, the building. Okay, I'm not here to harp on you about why you should make OERs or why you shouldn't, and I know there's several different disciplines that have issues and some don't, yada yada. This is literally just what I learned and what I noticed and observed during the grant period, which is not over yet. I will let you know we're in the first pilot stage. We just finished the first semester of um, running it live in classes. Um, and we're doing a second semester, and then I'll have to do another uh, report after that, and we've been tweaking it. So, um, how many of you have used OER so far? So a lot of you. Anybody made their own stuff? A little less. <laughs> uh, it was fun, right? No. Okay, so um, we're gonna cover like basically some of the overarching considerations that I found were really important that I that followed through that were themes when I was doing this development of this course. And just so you know, I did um, Introduction to Computing, which is in our core component area option is the <coughs> 1301 that a lot of students take and think they're just going to breeze through it because they know social media. <laughs> but it's not that class. So if you do hear someone say that, correct them. Um, I'm going to show you where I started to identify where to start, how to start it up, um, and uh, what the basic steps were that I followed. And, and believe me, I've looked all over the internet and there really isn't a one size fits all on developing an OER curriculum. There really, really isn't. There's a, it's a few common themes, but it's kind of a 
such a new thing, you fly by the seat of your pants. Um, and then I'm going to cover some of the mistakes that I, I, I made and learned from quickly. <clears throat> so I need everyone to go. I'm actually going to switch to this. Uh, where is it? This right here. There we go. I need everyone to go here because what I want to do is I don't want to have to stop and bring the mics or have y'all walk up here. Go to this uh, pigeonhole.at on your mobile device or computer and um, put in CPCO for the passcode. And what you'll see is a platform where you can type in questions and other people will be able to see your question. It's anonymous. I didn't make it where you had to sign up. And you will be able to rank the question. So if another person or two has that same question, you can vote for it and it'll push it to the top of my list. Okay. Everybody got that? Okay. I got ten people in there so far. Good. Does anybody else need the URL again? Pigeonhole.at. And then CTCO sure. is the passcode. <coughs> considerations that I came across for building this class using OER material. Um, of course, as always, and we've been harped on this quite a bit, is the, the, the attributions. Um, it's either public domain or the authors of OER materials have placed it in the Creative Commons under some sort of category. I'm not here to teach you all those. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, I was bound by the grant to do mine strictly as a, a CC by, no extras. So I had a discussion with them about it because there is an NC version, which is non-commercial, which means that no one else can take my material and earn money from it, but they wouldn't allow me to put that additional tag on it. So that was kind of something I wasn't thrilled about, but this is what the state wanted, and they're eventually gonna put it in a repository, so I don't know how that's all gonna work. So with the attributions, what I wanted to show you was that it's not like a student citing your materials. It's just giving credit to whoever created the item. And if you go to, let's see, I'm just gonna use this as an example. This is um, the Commonwealth of Learning. I, you'll find, I, I just, I don't care if it's Canadian or American, I use both. This is a Canadian site, but they have a lot of good information. <coughs> and um, they cover accrediting OER, uh, attributing OER, and basically, what this page does is it shows you how you can set up your materials to where how you want someone to attribute you. If you just put simply CC BY at the bottom, that's all the other person's required to do. But if you go ahead and create, a pre preform a, um, a template of what you want people to paste when they reuse your material, you can do so, that's within your rights. And that makes it a lot easier on people like me that are developing the stuff, because then I can just copy and paste it over into what I'm delivering. So this is a really neat site, and I wanted to show you all that. Um, it's Commonwealth of Learning. It's a Canadian site, but they have a lot of really good information on OER. Go back to the PowerPoint. I'm sorry, I was hoping to have split screens, but that didn't happen. Okay, ADA compliance was another big issue. Um, how do you make something ADA compliant when you're creating it from scratch? It depends on what you're creating. In Word, I found that was the easiest way to start things with, with my documents. Um, I just used Word strictly for everything. 
if there was a link out to something, I put the link in Word. If it was a video, I also put in um, how long the video was and a full title of the video. Um, images, you can't all tag in Word. But um, what you can do is there's an accessibility checker in Word. Does anybody know about that? Mm -hmm. How many of y'all have not heard that? There is an accessibility checker in Word, and it will run through your entire document and tell you where you have problems for ADA compliance. It's very handy. <laughs> it tells you where you need to have a tag or a header or anything like that. Um, so I found that was uh, that was an overarching concern that I had to constantly monitor. Um, no. When I'm using link outs to YouTube and stuff like that, of course they have closed captioning and transcripts available. Um, so I didn't have to, I didn't have to take on that responsibility. But if I had made my videos myself, I would have, of course had to have that some sort of setup for that. Um, the delivery platform, not to be confused confused with publishing. Uh, we've got when you're delivering your OER material as CTC, we use a Blackboard platform. Um, but ideally, you want it to be something since it's OER and it's open to be available to people worldwide. So you want it to be compatible with just being on the web. That was another reason that I chose Word and I didn't start out with one of the publishing platforms they have where you can author OER. OER Commons is one of the main ones. It's a really neat tool. You sign up and create an account and they've got like, um, it's almost like their own little black world, Blackboard world where you can change things and uh, <coughs> format and so forth. But in order for me to create something that was wholly available to just about anybody in the world where they could download it or not, um, I started with Word. And then at the end is when I decided where I wanted to publish it further. So you have to consider your delivery platform, and then of course, as instructors, we always know we need to consider our learning styles. Any questions so far? Let's see. Do we have questions? We have questions. We really need an extra cable up here that would be so cool. Oh, ice cream. <laughs> Dan said no. <laughs> no ice cream. As long as it's not DW. Oh my goodness. Okay, most free books online have such low quality and outdated or incorrect information. So how can quality education be maintained when the materials are outdated and not of high quality? That is beyond the scope of this presentation. <laughs> um, I can't disagree with that statement. However, that's why I did not use free books. That is one of many, many different OER resources that you can use. Um, I highlighted a couple. You can replace your textbook with a free text that you find online. That's one way. You can create your own content, like I've done from scratch with Word. Um, you can supplement with stuff that's already existing out there, like in OER Commons or via other college websites. Um, you can revise existing as long as that's what their license allows for. Um, and of course, we have the library and other internet resources. You do not have to use a book. I know, it. I will say this, it's a lot of work if you're not using something already pre-made. And I know a lot of departments like to have the traditional assessments as opposed to alternative assessments. I cannot speak for that. I was able to do alternative assessments in my department um, just because we are hands-on based and I was able to develop um, flowing projects for students to do. But I, I just, I really don't have a good answer for that and it's, it's just, it wasn't something that I had to address because I was able to find other resources. Uh, how is student satisfaction with OER content? That is something you're gonna have to ask Dean Davis. I think she's still here. Um, I, I have no idea. She's been running some surveys each time an OER class is run. I have not seen the results really of, of the, the most recent semester, but I'm sure she will be willing to provide that for you. <clears throat> is there someone at CTC available to assist us with getting our courses ADA compliant? My first stop would be Dean Davis and Dean Purser in the library. Um, between those two, I got a lot of uh, information and then I just researched a lot on my own, um, trying to figure out and make odds and ends of everything. It, I, I'm not perfect at it, I can assure you there's so much out there, but I did, I, I did have confidence in knowing that everything that's on the internet that I found I researched enough to make sure that it was in compliance with anything that a person with a screen reader would need and so forth. Of course, we can't publish our stuff in Braille or anything like that, but within, I think the, the rule is within reasonable accommodations is the word they use, reasonable. 
So um, I felt pretty confident that what I created was reasonable for 88 clients. Uh, let's see. Is there a conflict between keeping academic freedom for professionals to choose their materials and those materials being mandated? What does the Texas Board of Education? Y'all are asking some really hard questions. <laughs> um, I haven't run into that, to be honest with you. So I really can't speak to that. Um, have you had any issues with conflict, uh, conflict with academic freedoms and OERs? Does anybody know how the concept and the idea of OER started? It started with um, Bill Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates, and Achieving the Dream. And they picked 38 schools across the nation to start developing OERs because they are basically humanitarians. And they knew that the poverty level was so great and so many students were struggling, they wanted to be able to help that with the rising cost of education. So it's not just new to Texas. I mean, this has been going on since 2016. So what happened is when some of the schools of Texas became involved, then that's like a, like a flash fire. Of course, everybody, the communities, the government, the legislature, everybody started putting pressure on the schools to try to make materials free because the publishers were so expensive and tuition was so expensive. So it's something that right now is not being mandated, but it's being strongly encouraged and I probably push a little bit beyond that um, because we want to be competitive with our other schools. ACC is now on three Z degrees. That means they have a complete degree that can be done with no, cost, no text cost. Um, they had two last fall. They added a third one this fall in business. Um, Montgomery College has a free Z degree. And that we're really not so much concerned about courses as we are about degrees to keep competitive. And this is the trend. Right now, I think all schools that I know of are working on Z degrees. Do they all have them yet? They're close. There will be more and more as they go along. And you are required by legislation to mark in your schedule which are no cost textbooks. And so if you're the student that comes and they can take a no cost course, a course with no cost for the book compared to one with the book, guess what they're gonna choose? It's gonna become student driven. And so we're just trying to get ahead of it, which is why we are pushing it so hard. I haven't spoken to anybody at the cohort about uh, infringing on academic freedoms. And I can't speak outside of what I've done with the grant. Um, I will say from personal experience, it is a lot easier for me to work with this grant and have the timeline set for me and I'm getting compensated. I will say that. Um, I, I have no answers for you on what the college is going to do regarding future development of OER for us and how that's going to work out. I, I just, I really can't speak to it at all. I will tell you that the state has a nice timeline set up. They give us the, the boundaries. Um, I have not been forced to cover anything other than the outcomes as an expert, which is what I wrote my content based on. Um, and then I found supplements on the internet, and of course I'm getting compensated the $5,000 for doing so, and, and then I get an additional 3,000 for monitoring and up, keeping, keeping the course updated for three years. After that, it is no longer my responsibility and the course will be rebuilt. So I hope that kind of helps answer those questions. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Clients already answered that one. I don't know about publisher concerns. Um, have we had any publishers express concern about CTC? Are, are we? That's their business. Well, that's their business. But I'm, I mean, um, if you're using their copyrighted materials, then that would mean that we're purchasing and the students set buying it from the bookstore. I would hope. Um, if you're not doing that, then you're doing something illegal. <laughs> I can't speak to that, I'm not doing that. Um, compensation, I kind of just covered. What is OER? Um, there's 
so many different definitions for it, but the, the bottom line is open education resources are items that are openly available to anyone to access that are specified to a discipline or learning topic. Um, they can be in text form, video form, there's all different versions of it. So it's just literally anything that's in the open dom public domain or uh, Creative Commons open licensing that is free and accessible to anyone to use or learn from. Um, that's the, I mean, that's the best way I could put it without going and looking up all the different definitions you can find at different schools, but they all run along the same theme. Um, if a student wants a printed copy of an OER or need to comply with ADA, how will the bookstore deliver this? I don't think we're taking on that responsibility, to be honest with you. Again, I think that's something that the dean would have to answer. Um, for mine, it's all in PDF. They can download it and then upload it to their computer and click the links from there. Um, it's something that they can print, but we don't offer it through the bookstore. I, I don't know if we're working on that, huh? Mine aren't offered in the bookstore, at least. <laughs> some things are and some are not. Okay. Uh, it depends on the publisher. If we're using a, an OER textbook, we try to find one that will uh, provide, it, provide a printed copy. Now, that's where the cost comes in, but usually the printed copy is at a low cost, maybe fifteen dollars And a lot of students, according to the surveys that we get, and I forwarded it to the department chairs, I don't remember who it was, uh, this, a lot of the students still want to have the uh, printed copy of hand. They like the flexibility of the, being able to access the materials online. They say they can do it on the bus, they can do it at work or whatever, so they like that. But some still like to have a book, kind of as a comfort, you know, like my client is blanket. So we're, we're trying to, to get, to make accommodations through the bookstore so that most of the items can also be purchased uh, through the bookstores. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch back to my PowerPoint and I wanna remind y'all this is not about what y'all need to be doing or what CTC is moving forward with OER. This is just my experience on developing a class. So if, we could, if you could help me and contain your questions to this area. A lot of these I really just, I cannot answer. I'm sorry. We can try to answer. But, we but I, I have a short time too. <laughs> okay, so. Um, on to, uh, where did I start? Of course I started first with uh, where you would normally start your, your learning outcomes at the Wecom or the ACGM, whichever course it is you're using. Workforce or ACGM, everybody's familiar with that, correct? Okay. I heard a no. Who said no? Okay. If you work at CTC or in any college in the state of Texas, you have either workforce courses or academic courses. The Wacom dictates the workforce courses, which are computer science, industrial tech, office technology, those type of things. Academics are mathematics, science, engineering, and so forth. Um, academic courses are fully transferable to a four-year institution in the state of Texas. Wacom courses are not. We have to make individual agreements with each and every school if they're willing to take them, and we have to make a lot of stipulations. That is the main difference between those two, and those are our overarching guides from the co coordinating board on where we get our learning outcomes and course descriptions. This is what you see in the catalog. This is what we cannot change. We can add to it, but we cannot take away or modify. Good? Okay. So, um, of course, I started with my, uh, my Wacom learning outcomes, and then I organized them into an outline. It was a really long document at first. Um, because what I did was I created objectives for each of those outcomes. And we all know that outcomes are the overarching results that we're, we're gonna measure for the course. The objectives are each teeny tiny little individual bite of the outcomes. So uh, once I did that and I divided them into ob objectives, uh, the objectives and outcomes into modules, I ended up with something that looked like uh, a blank document, I promise. <laughs> Why it went away? Try and open it back. It was open. I'm sorry. There we go. I ended up with something that looked like this. So A, B, C, all the way through M were the learning outcomes from the Wecom. As you see, it looks just like in our syllabi. It's got the scans behind it and everything. So I literally just copied and pasted. 
Then I went through and I itemized. I figured out for outcome one, I need to cover this, 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 and this, and I literally broke it down to little teeny tiny bites. And I know you don't really care about my computer class, but I just wanted to see what that looked like and how I, I, I divided it up. And I, of course, I did it in a logical sequence of how the student would learn the, the material and they um, would, because uh, you know, when we get the, the outcomes that from Wacom or ACGM, they're not exactly in the order we would teach them. I don't know if you'll notice that or not, they just kind of put them out there. So you have to be the expert and place everything in order. So that's what my document ended up looking, looking like before I even started curating content and putting things together. Okay? Um, then uh, that's when I came to the curation part of the materials. And curating basically meant not collecting a bunch of lists. I mean, that was the, that's literally the first thing you do is you just start searching the internet for computer hardware stuff. And you make a list of all the links that look kind of good. The curation part comes back when you go through and you literally, like a student, read through each and every item you found and see which one has the most value and accuracy for that objective. So the curation is what really takes a long time. Um, and it's back and forth, back and forth, because sometimes I would go to a, a link or a resource and it would link to something else. I'm like, oh, that's even better. And I've changed my mind. And, I mean, it was just, I was chasing my tail a lot before finalizing things. After I curated, I matched those up to that um, outline I showed you. And then where I had gaps, where I didn't need an objective with a resource, or if I didn't feel it was enough supplemented for that objective, that's when I went back to my research and back, tried to find more, or I created my own. And this was where it was kind of funny. I was, I was, just, uh, I was just stuck in that mode of I have to cite everything I use. And then I, it hit me after I wrote the first module that I am the expert, and I don't have to cite my own stuff. <laughs> so then the words kind of started flowing. But literally, I, I just I wrote my own content. It was like little short, not say, I wouldn't say chapters, but sections to fill in those gaps to explain things that weren't quite explained through the resources that I found. So once I get everything met, as far as a resource created or curated, that's when I started building the assignments and the learning activities and, and kind of building the course from the point where we would be in a blackboard shell. Everything before that was a lot of heavy lifting, but this is the point when I really started looking at the blackboard side of things and okay, what am I gonna do for grades? Now for the state grant, I did create major projects because I knew they were gonna be shared across the state with everybody that teaches this course, but the individual learning activities and the smaller assignments, I did not create for the state because I feel those are something that we kind of can keep contained in here and we would be fluid about changing them simply because we don't want students duplicating other students from the previous semester's work so we can rotate that stuff out. But the major projects are very um, independent and focused on the content as a whole and allows for a lot of room for creativity on the students part as well as uh, eliminates the chances of duplication among students. So that's why I, I left those out there. All right, any other questions? have any more questions on this stuff? It keeps online sites from using professors' work from being used for free if they are encouraged to create their own content. Well, the whole point of creating an OER is to share it. It's not yours, really. I mean, it's yours, but you get credit for it, but you're sharing it. So I wouldn't be too concerned with other sites using it. It's kind of like a compliment, I would say. Uh, I, to me, if I load myself into OER Commons and I have like 50 downloads in the past week, that shows me that people are interested in what I created and that it's probably pretty decent. So I wouldn't be too concerned about that unless you're actually writing your own book and you actually want to get paid for it. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, fine tuning and finalizing, that's why I wrote out my introductions that we see in our Blackboard shells. Um, I define scoring and grading all that administrative work that we as faculty have to do. Create rubrics if you want. I did find that rubrics are a huge help when you're using OERs. We're still working on tweaking things, but without the rubrics, we would have been drowning a lot worse than we already were in grade. <laughs> uh, Professor Owens helped compile it this past semester, and we were dying. So um, 
Uh, of course, then you review and you compare the activities and content with the outcomes. So <coughs> that's the point where I looked at the assignments and assessments that created, and I go back to that that table I made, um, the, the outline, and I make sure that each one of those activities matches some, some objectives on that list. And um, then I created a resource list of all of the resources that I did not create. Videos, links, articles, anything that is in my content that the student is going to use that I did not create, I made a list for myself. <coughs> and that's how I check my course to make sure that there's no broken links. Rather than going back into Blackboard and scrolling through each and every lesson, I have a compiled list. I can just click, click, click. The links all work, and I'm good. Found that to be a really big help. So if you do create something, make yourself a master list of your resources. It's very handy. Um, then, of course, you want to make sure you verify that you have all your attributions for anything you were used or remixed, and verify for the last time your ADA compliance. And you can then publish, pilot, and perfect, which is the stage we're at. We've done our first pilot. Actually, um, the internal pilot I did was literally I just gave it to a few people in the department. I sent it to my friend in Maryland. Um, I asked a couple people in the neighborhood. Literally just like, hey, look at this from your point of view as a non-computer student, a computer student, or an expert in the field, and tell me what you think. And I got a lot of good feedback that way. And then that's when we did the external line pilot this past semester we did about 11 sections, and we did all varieties and different lengths, self-paced, not self-paced, to find out what worked and what didn't. And uh, from that, we were able to identify a lot of issues and problems that, um, that arose. We were able to fine-tune our rubrics. Um, we consolidated some of our projects a little bit more. And um, uh, if there was any gaps in learning content, which I don't think we found any gaps. We did pretty good on the learning content part, but we did have to uh, combine assessments a little bit more and uh, <laughs> the biggest issue we had and I talked to a Dr. Heath about this the other day students approach a course that has OER when they find out they don't have to buy material and everything's right there in Blackboard they tend to ignore it mm -hmm. they, they, they I mean they would literally go straight to our assignments and only do the assignments and it was apparent they had not read any of the content because we built the assignments on the content so that taught us that we need to, in the assignments, point back somehow to the content. Module 3, Section 2, you learned about blah, blah, blah. This is your assignment for that. Because if not, they were failing miserably. Because they just thought they were the experts of Google. And uh, <laughs> um, it was pretty bad. <laughs> so uh, that was a, that was a big learn, learning point for us. Um, and then towards the end, we're going to be doing our, just our monitoring and maintaining, which Dean Davis helps with that. Um, of course, students comment in the discussion boards because they uh, feel like it's a Facebook wall. Um, giving their complaints and compliments about the course, about the OER materials, and when, when we see something, we address it, or try to at least, um, if it's something that we can't address. And then that master of content list, we can check to make sure those links are still working and if we need to replace something. Um, I, I will say if you're creating something like this, if it's kind of a Frankenstein type of course, I would be prepared to change quickly. It, um, especially when you're in the live courses, because you know the students, even though they don't want to turn in their work on time, they don't share <coughs> information on time. So you have to uh, constantly be looking for replacement material. Um, it's, I'm not saying that you have to spend your whole life looking up new stuff for this course. But you know, when I'm reading a magazine or something like that, and something gets me, oh yeah, that would be cool for that course, I kind of try to follow it away somewhere. Um, one thing I wanted to tell y'all is to avoid direct links when possible. So I have an example here of an assignment. I can find it. I had all this stuff over my board. We'll just have to open it again. So this, this example is going to kind of clear up what I mean. I don't mean don't give them links to the videos you want them to see or something like that. But if you're doing, doing an assignment like this one here, we want the students to look up computer ethic guidelines, the overarching guidelines across the world. Um, now, I could have went to the Association for Computing and Machinery and given them the direct link to where that they host their ethics policies. But as we all know, these large corporations and businesses rearrange their websites a lot, and next week that link will be moved.
So to prevent having to go and change that and encourage the student to do research and, and things on their own, I give them the website they need to find, the exact document they need to find. They go find where it's linked and read it, perform their work and their assignment, and I'm removed from the responsibility of maintaining a link. So any time that you can incorporate that in your class, do it. I recommend it highly. Any questions on that? <laughs> Somebody needs money. I don't know who that is, but I have money to give you. Sorry. Okay. So, um, so the other thing was, and I think I've already mentioned this before, is tying everything back to that content to encourage them to read it because they literally thought they were the Google queens and kings of the world. And um, uh, for example, our first project was on uh, the um, Internet of Things, and they had to develop their own invention of, of a new Internet of Things uh, device. And you could tell they did not look at any of the content that we asked them to review on how to develop an I IoT device uh, or any of the components that it required. Because, I mean, we just, we got some farming animals, and I'm just like, where does technology fit into that? <laughs> they just really threw stuff out there and hoped it stuck to the wall. So be very explicit with your instructions. Tie it back to that content that you're using everywhere you can. Um, I even kind of hit in the content. Sometimes I would be like, think about this question. You'll need it later. Or write these concepts down after you review this link. You'll need it later, so kind of lead them towards that they'll be prepared for that assignment. And then, of course, always solicit the students' feedback regarding the OER. And don't be upset if they give you negative feedback. It's also, it's good, negative or positive. It's, it's going to be helpful in some way. And, you know, you're always going to have those jerk students. That's okay. You just, you don't even have to respond. You just say thank you and keep on going. So that is all I have for that. Were there any other questions? Mm -hmm. No. The first one. I the first one. one. The ice cream? No. <laughs> no. Because Jan already said no to the ice well, cream. Well, there's another one. Oh, well, yeah. There's several down at the bottom. Yeah, at the bottom. The question really is about using the... Um, Heed your voice. <laughs> She's got a, she's got a <laughs> about the check links tool in Blackboard, did it work? Does it work? The check links tool in Blackboard. Yeah, so that you can. Um, I check don't use a tool in Blackboard. I created a, my own master list. So you never did use Word the document. Blackboard tool. That was. Yep. And if the, I mean, I know where everything is in my course because I made that little course map. Mm -hmm. So in my Word document, I would literally click the links to check to see if they're live. And if there was an error, then I could just go in the Blackboard and fix that real quick. That way, I'm not changing screens and going back and forth. And did I check this one already? I do that a lot in Blackboard. I'm like, did I just do that one? Right. Yeah. Right. Any others? Yes. How long did this process take you? I took every minute I could. Like um, the 11th hour, I was turning in. So um, we started. Kind of thing. A year and a half ago. Um, once I once I got awarded the grant, I'd already started my my research in October of what 20. 17, 2018, and I literally worked every spare moment I had up until May when I had to produce some sort of finished document for them. Um, I just, I couldn't, I didn't calculate hours, but I, it was a lot. It really, really was. And, and um, I think if I had to do it over again, I probably would have an additional download. <laughs> because, it, I mean, just that part up. Not even the Blackboard part, just the creation of the curriculum itself is just so time intensive because you're going back and forth trying to make sure you have just the right information and just the right um, content to cover learning styles and, and you're covering everything you possibly could want to. And I, I mean, realistically, we don't cover in a book, if we adopt a book for a class, we don't cover that whole book usually. I mean, it's just impossible. But you just want to make sure that you're covering the right topics and the most important key points and everything like that. So. Um, it, it was it was a little more than I, I thought I was, was I was going I was expecting let's put it that way, but I, I literally did the, the day it was due, I was turning it in like right before they closed at the code board. <laughs> yes. What has been your student feedback on this format? 
I have not seen much student feedback yet. Um, I'm hoping to get some of that from Dean Davis here soon. The courses just ended in December that we had in the fall. Um, what I saw in the, in the discussion boards, and I, I think Professor Owens can attest to this, is uh, uh, a lot of students really liked it. They liked the flow and they, they felt like they learned quite a bit. But that was the few that actually read the content. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Do you feel like you had a gap between, like, because I mean, this is kind of a new concept for a lot of students. Did, did you have, like, any issues, like, teaching them how to do this kind of a course, or was that, like, pretty easy for them to grasp right away, or did, did you address that at all? Um, in, a, in a way, yes, I did address it. Um, and again, every OER course is a little <laughs> different, but the way I set mine up was, and y'all can check it out. It's on the library website under the OER resources, it's out there. Um, I consolidated it into one full PDF. So when those students email for classes start and say, what books do I use? I drag them to the link. <laughs> it doesn't have the assignments in there, but they can still look at the content. Um, but I did tell them, okay, you know, this is, a, this is a, an OER course. This is how your content's gonna look. And I literally took each module and I post, pasted it into one content area of Blackboard. So they can just scroll straight down and read all their information, click all the links right there. And then there's a separate section that I explained to them was for their assignments. And uh, we also, that was something we changed midway through the semester. We had the assignments kind of randomly spaced in their own individual shells in Blackboard. We put them in a folder, and the folder literally has a description that says, everything you need that is graded for this module is inside this folder. That way there was no, do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? You know, because we usually tell them, go look at the syllabus. It's, it's clear in the syllabus. But when we created that folder, we saw a major increase in participation. Because they knew where everything was. They knew this was what I needed to read. This is what I needed to do. And then I'm done with this module. We try to help you find materials that are available as print at a cost. OpenStax has an, a license with our bookstore. So if you choose an OpenStax book, then the bookstore can provide it to our students. Um, I think that Catrice or somebody mentioned the Georgia University. Right now, you can the students can purchase the book through the North Georgia University uh, print press or something. And there's a, we provide a link to it. And I don't think it's very expensive. I think, again, it's like $20 if you don't want to have your own printed. Uh, you don't have to go online and print everything out yourself. And we're trying to get agreements through the bookstore with those places as well so that uh, the, you, know, you don't have to go someplace else to get your materials. And with respect to instructor resources, it's true that for some of the books, you get a book, and that's it. And depending on the license, some books you have to use like they are so you can change. Some, if you change.